Good evening, and thank you for joining the Evans Maywell 2021 Medicare Update. We are excited to be partnering with Medicare expert, Melinda Coghill, who will be presenting on updates to Medicare for this year, as well as information on open enrollment. But before we dive in, I would like to introduce my colleague, Emily Palmer. Emily is the newest addition to Evans May Wealth as our financial planner. Prior to joining Evans May Wealth, she worked at Capital Group, where she specialized in uh, retirement plans, as well as worked as a business consultant on complex issues. In addition to that, she's worked in philanthropy, specializing in charitable trusts. Emily? Hello, Brooke. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm excited to be on board with Evans May Wealth and I appreciate your attendance tonight and hope that we can continue to bring interesting and educational topics to you into the future. We'll be recording the presentation tonight and we'll make the recording available so that you can review any of tonight's topics again. We will leave 10 to 15 minutes at the end of the presentation to review any submitted questions. To submit your questions, if you scroll to the bottom of your screen, you'll see that there's a Q&A option. There's also a chat option. Please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen to submit any questions and we will review those at the end. Our goal is to review all of the submitted questions, but we may not get to all of them due to time constraints. Please note that Melinda is unable to answer specific situational questions tonight. And now I would like to introduce our speaker, Melinda Coghill. Melinda is a prolific Medicare speaker and consultant. She offers her expertise to advisors, individuals, and corporations. She's the co-founder of i65 and 65incorporated.com, which is a website that we recommend as a resource available to you to assist with answering Medicare related questions. Melinda has been actively helping individuals navigate the Medicare open enrollment landscape, offering unbiased advice as she is not associated with an insurance company for years, including this year, and brings her insights from her experience to this presentation. And to that, we say welcome, Melinda Coghill. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. So I'm, I'm really excited because this presentation happens right in the smack dab middle of Medicare's open enrollment period. But I am going to digress backwards a little bit because my purpose is not just to tell you about open enrollment today, but to give you a full picture of the entire Medicare landscape. And that way, hopefully you can avoid Medicare mistakes, avoid Medicare mistakes in the future, all sorts of things. So Medicare is quite the complex little topic here. So um, as so let me let me just move forward. This is me blah, blah, blah. You already heard about me. Let's move on. Let's get to the Medicare stuff. So let's get started by understanding the Medicare landscape overall. All right. I don't know how many of you have actually tried to attempt to dig into Medicare, but it's kind of confusing. <laughs> if you've tried it all, you probably said, what? Well, 3.6 million people are in the same boat as you potentially each and every year. 3.6 million people in this country turn 65 per year. And when it comes to Medicare, they're all going to say pretty much the same thing. It doesn't make sense. So what winds up happening is that people go through Medicare enrollment, they wind up making Medicare mistakes. And what people don't realize about these mistakes is how costly they can be, how permanent they can be, and how they can even potentially keep you from getting needed healthcare services. Medicare mistakes are nothing to trifle with. In fact, our company, we tried to put our arms around how big is the Medicare mistakes problem in this country. So what we did is we created an average client experience and then extrapolated that number out to the national population. In this way, we've estimated seniors make wait for it, $6.4 billion worth of Medicare enrollment mistakes annually. And to that, you probably go, really? Come on, Melinda, you're making that up. No, I promise you I'm not. So what I like to do at this point is to give you three case studies. I could give you case studies all day long. Don't worry, I won't do that. But I'm going to subject you to three because it gives you kind of a good insight in, into what is happening. So first, John. So when John turned 65, he was still working 
And he went into his employer and said, hey guys, what do I need to do about Medicare? And they said, nothing, you're still working. You have the employer provided health coverage. You're good, see you later, bye. So John didn't do anything related to Medicare which turned out to be unfortunate because John worked for a small company, less than 20 employees. As a result, John should have taken action to enroll in Medicare Part A and Part B, but he didn't do that. Uh, so when you work for a small employer, the Medicare Part A and Part B is the primary payer and the employer provided health coverage is the secondary payer. By not enrolling in Medicare, John doesn't have a primary payer. He defaults to becoming the primary payer. He thought everything was okay for about a year, but then the insurance company put all the pieces together and started redirecting all the healthcare bills back to John to pay. So John, oops, it sort of skipped backwards. Sorry about that. So John is now on the hook for what? $505,000, $50,000? Well, it depends all on the healthcare services John has received since turning 65. Ouch. Okay, that was one. Here comes number two. All right. So David and Sandy, this is a married couple. When Sandy turned 65, her Medicare card arrived in the mail. Boom, there it was. So when David turned 65 six months later, he waited for his Medicare card to arrive in the mail. But his didn't come and it didn't come and it didn't come. Finally, he got on the phone and said, hey, Medicare, where's my card? And they said, hey, David, you never enrolled. What? And that's when the differences became clear. Sandy was already drawing social security benefits when she turned 65. So Medicare enrollment for her was automatic. But David was not yet drawing social security benefits. So he had to take action to enroll in Medicare and didn't know that. So now he is outside of his initial enrollment period. He has to wait for the general enrollment period, which happens January through March. When you need to use the, gen the general enrollment period, Medicare coverage doesn't even begin until July 1st. So he's going to pay a late enrollment penalty. And what is he going to do for health coverage until Medicare actually kicks in? I don't know. Will he be able to get anything? I don't know. So that's David and Sandy. Okay, that was two. Last one. Here we go. All right, so this is Jane. When Jane was 65, she was working for a large employer, never enrolled in Medicare Part A and Part B. For her, that was fine. The problem came two years later when she was 67. Her employer walked into her office and said, hey, Jane, I'm really sorry we have to let you go. So Jane went on the company's COBRA coverage. To Jane, this was the same coverage she had always had, just more expensive. She never even thought about Medicare. Well, for about 10 months, everything appeared to be fine. Jane barely saw doctors, barely had anything happen from a medical standpoint. But then in the 10th month, Jane wound up in the emergency room. In the emergency room, she got a stage four cancer diagnosis. At that point, the hospital administrator came walking in and said, Jane, do you know you don't have health insurance? What are you talking about? I gave you my COBRA card. I have COBRA. Look, the card's right there. Jane, did you enroll in Medicare? No, because I have COBRA. And that's when everything bad happened. So when employer provided coverage is no longer related to active employment, Medicare treats it differently. Retiree coverage, COBRA coverage. Jane's COBRA coverage was not related to active employment. So it is secondary payer to Medicare coverage. She never enrolled in Medicare Part A and Part B. She has a secondary payer, no primary payer. That's like having no health insurance at all. So the unfortunate thing, well, like that wasn't unfortunate enough. Another unfortunate thing was Jane's emergency room visit happened outside of her special enrollment period. Special enrollment periods only last eight months. She was at 10 months. So she now has to wait for the general enrollment period, which happens January through March. And again, remember, Medicare coverage doesn't even begin until July 1st. She has almost an entire year of being the primary payer for stage four cancer treatments. Yeah. 
And there you go. These are the kind of things that actually happen to people. And all of a sudden that $6.4 billion doesn't seem so wacky anymore. Yeah, because quite frankly, this isn't good. But why is it happening? Well, the reason it's happening is because we are literally forcing seniors to become Medicare experts simply to enroll in the program. In fact, many of you, when you're about to turn 65, will automatically get a guide in the mail from Medicare explaining Medicare and enrollment. It's called Medicare and You. Here's the thing. The 2021 version of this booklet is 127 pages in length. So no, thank you. I don't want to do that. So where else will I turn? How about the Social Security Administration? That makes sense because technically Social Security is the administration that administers Medicare, takes the registrations, does premiums, penalties, etc. But Social Security by itself has 2,700 rules and thousands of codiciles, but only one phone number. So regardless of whether you want to talk about Social Security or Medicare, one phone number and you get who's ever up next regardless of what they know and often don't know about medicare in our experience about one out of every five one out of every six clients just gets flat out wrong information from social security it's not pretty so if the social security administration isn't working the medicare and you book isn't working quite frankly where are you supposed to turn for help there you go. That is the point. So what are we supposed to do? Well, luckily you're here. Yay. Good first step. Okay. So the first thing that I always tell people is to get to know the steps of Medicare enrollment. That is a huge, massive, good place to start. So most people today, unfortunately, though, will tell you that Medicare is a three step process. Step one, choose your plans. United Healthcare, Humana, Aetna, Blue Cross, Blue Shield. Choose your plans. Once you've chosen your plans, then you enroll in Medicare. Get enrolled in Medicare, get your Medicare card in the mail, and then last but definitely not least, sign up for the plans you initially chose. Okay, three steps, right? Mm -mm. Nope. Eh. Wrong answer. Okay, Medicare enrollment is actually six steps. And the three steps that are missing from most people's perceptions are actually three of the most crucial. So we're going to teach you today all six steps of the Medicare enrollment process. Okay, so we'll start really at the true number one step. Step one of the Medicare enrollment process again not picking plans, it's actually determine your timing. Is it best for you to enroll in Medicare at age 65 or should you be delaying Medicare enrollment? Because as you've seen in all three case studies, all three case studies were all timing mistakes. So how crazy is it that most of the world doesn't even recognize this as a step of Medicare enrollment, much less the first step? Yeah, so don't make assumptions. Is it best for you to enroll in Medicare or should you be delaying Medicare enrollment? It's critical to start here. Once you know that you need to enroll in Medicare, step two becomes determining your Medicare path. And when we say your Medicare path, what we're talking about is the type of coverage that's best for your unique needs. So is it original Medicare with a Medigap policy? Is it Medicare Advantage? Is it retiree coverage, military coverage, federal employee health benefits? It really depends on your situation. And it's really important you take the time to look at these various options and determine what is best for you, not your spouse, not your best friend, not an insurance agent's portfolio. The type of coverage you choose today can become a permanent decision. So you know, you may not be able to change the type of coverage that you have 10, 20 years from now. So timing and then type. Once you know those two, then you can go ahead and choose specific plans. Makes much more sense here, doesn't it? So again, this is the step where you start picking United Healthcare, Humana, Aetna, Blue Cross, Blue Shield. Please make this step three, not step one. It's not the most important step. It's not the only step. It's not what Medicare is all about. It's just one of six steps. Okay, so timing, type, 
then specific plans, then you start the enrollment process into Medicare. You get your Medicare card in the mail, you sign up for the specific plans you chose in step three, and then last, but definitely not least, no, sorry to be the bearer of bad news, but once you are enrolled in Medicare, no, you're not done. No, 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 you are definitely not done. Everybody should be reviewing their coverage annually, all right? So every year between October 15th and December 7th, review your Part D prescription drug plan or your Medicare Advantage plan, depending on which type you have. Do not put Medicare on autopilot, please. All right, so those are the six steps of Medicare enrollment. The reason that everybody thinks Medicare enrollment is all about picking specific plans is because that's what every insurance agent, every insurance company, and the Medicare.gov plan finder all focus on. But what's missing from the landscape today of help is timing and type. There are very few things out there truly helping with these steps other than self-education. So yay, we're here. This is what we're going to focus on today because quite frankly, messing those up is scary. So let's get right into the specifics of timing and type. Okay. All right. So timing, when it comes to timing your Medicare enrollment, there's basically five things that you need to be keeping an eye on. Five things that determine whether you enroll in Medicare partially, fully, or completely delay Medicare enrollment. So they are social security benefit status, type and quality of health coverage, your employer size, employment status, and last but definitely not least, HSA, health savings account. Are you making contributions to a health savings account? All right, so let's dig into each one of these in specific, specifically. Social security benefits. If you are receiving benefits before you turn 65, Medicare enrollment will be automatic. Remember, Sandy and David, Sandy was already receiving social security benefits. Her Medicare card showed up in the mail. You have to keep at least Medicare Part A. It's a stipulation that you have to follow if you want to continue drawing social security benefits. You can then opt to keep Medicare Part A or return Medicare Part A, meaning you're not moving forward with Part, oh, sorry, part B getting my letters mixed up. You can choose whether or not you want to keep part B. <laughs> B as in boy. You can keep part B or you potentially can send part B back. Only part A is required if you're receiving social security. Okay, so that's, that's social security. Then employer size. We're going to talk about a small employer first. So a company with fewer than 20 employees. Remember, this was John's, John's experience. First, a company, a small company, can tell those people 65 and older, no, I'm sorry, we're not going to keep you on the employer group health plan anymore. They can do that. That is, that is legal for small companies only. If you can keep the coverage after turning 65, this coverage will be secondary to Medicare, meaning regardless of whether you remain on the employer group plan or not, you need to enroll in Medicare Part A and Part B. Otherwise, you don't have a primary payer. Not having a primary payer is like having no health insurance at all. Okay, so that's a small employer. Now let's talk about a large employer, 20 or more employees. These companies have to provide the same benefits to people 65 and older as they do for everyone else. You cannot discriminate. They can't offer you incentives to enroll in Medicare and have you shift. Part A Enrollment is recommended, but not required. Again, people think Part A is like necessary for everybody 65 and older. No, that's a myth. It's only required if you're receiving Social Security benefits. So Part A enrollment recommended, but not required. Part B enrollment optional, and in my opinion, definitely not recommended. And you're going to learn a heck of a lot more about this as we go along. Um, late enrollment penalties will not apply as long as you maintain continuous coverage with no gaps in coverage of eight months or more. You will qualify for a special enrollment period. We're going to talk about that again in a little bit. Just a little bit more about um, um, employer-provided coverage now. So employment status 
is also a huge driver. So this was Jane's situation. So Jane had COBRA coverage. COBRA is not related to active employment. Retiree coverage, severance co package coverage, all of these things you are no longer actively working and the health coverage that you get is not through active employment. As a result, it is secondary to Medicare. Medicare is the primary payer. So we have issues sometimes with HR people who will say you have severance coverage and you know that it's the same employer provided coverage only we're doing you a big favor by paying for this coverage for you after you retire. Don't worry about Medicare. Yes, worry about Medicare. <laughs> HR people, not very good all the time at understanding Medicare. They have a lot of plates that they're spinning and Medicare often is not a priority. So A and B are required regardless of what the HR person calls it. Retiree coverage, severance package coverage, doesn't matter. So without Medicare, there is no primary payer. All right, so employment status, now number four, health savings, actually, yeah, health savings account. So HSAs, once you are enrolled in any part of Medicare, including just part A, you are no longer eligible to make contributions to a health savings account. If you are in a high deductible plan after the age of 65 and not taking social security benefits, think long and hard about whether it is better to continue making contributions to a health savings account or taking Medicare Part A. Choose one or the other. You cannot do both. If you try to do both, the IRS will figure it out and they will, um, they will at the end of the year, require that you withdraw any, any amounts that you contributed since you were enrolled in Part A and they will charge you an excise tax, so excise penalty. So, once you are enrolled in Medicare, you can use HSA funds for everything except paying for a Medigap policy. It's the only thing you can't do. All right. Now, timing of Medicare enrollment. Let's talk about the enrollment periods. There are actually like 40 some enrollment periods, but there's really, when it comes right down to it, three that you need to know about. So first, the initial enrollment period. This obviously is your initial period to get enrolled in Medicare. It is the seven month period surrounding your birth month. So if my birthday is January 23rd, my my initial enrollment period begins three months before my birth month, includes my birth month, and then ends three months after my birth month. Now, if your birthday is on the first of the month, this changes. <laughs> then your initial enrollment period starts four months before your birth month, includes your birth month, and ends two months after your birth month. Why? I just like to say because it's Medicare. <laughs> So, so that's your initial enrollment period. That is your initial time to get enrolled in Medicare. You can potentially determine during your initial enrollment period, okay, well, I have employer provided coverage. I'm not taking social security benefits. So I'm going to delay Medicare enrollment. Then the special enrollment period is really what you're looking for next. The special enrollment period is a period of eight months. You get to trigger when you start this period. You can decide well, your health coverage isn't necessarily ending, but you don't really like it anymore. So I'm going to drop it and enroll in Medicare. I'm going to start my special enrollment period now or now. <laughs> so you have to qualify for a special enrollment period though. So what that means to qualify is you've been covered continuously with no gaps in coverage of eight months or more by an employer health plan provided through active employment or that of a spouse. Again, coverage continuous with no significant gaps. All right, that's a special enrollment period. Now, general enrollment period. These are for the people who miss their initial enrollment period and don't qualify for a special enrollment period, like Jane, unfortunately. It occurs January 1st through March 31st each year and coverage will not begin until July 1st when you use the general enrollment period. Good news. Um, coronavirus legislation will change this in 2023. So then it will not wait until July 1st any longer. 
Okay, so those are the three enrollment periods that are really crucial. Now, if you have to use the general enrollment period, you need to be aware of late enrollment penalties. So the part, there's part B and part D as in dog penalties. The part B penalty permanently increases your monthly part B premium by 10% of the part B amount, whatever that is currently, for a each full year that you didn't enroll in Medicare when you should have. So there's a basically a calculation there. All right, so then the Part D late enrollment penalty is different. It increases the monthly premium of whatever Part D drug plan you're on by 1% of the standard Part D drug plan for each month that you did not have creditable drug coverage. So months, years, there you go. Now, the thing you need to know about Part B and Part D is that these late enrollment penalties are not like parking tickets where you pay them once and you're done. Nope, they follow you each month for the rest of your life. So be careful with late enrollment penalties, okay? All right, so that's timing. Yay, all right, now we get to move into step two, determining your Medicare path. Which type of coverage is best for your unique needs? Again, really important to take the time to do the research and really understand the type of coverage that you're picking. In order to walk you through this, I need to back up to what something Medicare tells everybody. Medicare is four parts. You've probably heard that. And no, we don't teach it like this. The reason we don't teach it like this is because we've seen too many clients go, I have to get an A, a B, a C, and a D. No, 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 no. Technically, C is just a different way to get A, B, and D. So we prefer to teach that Medicare has three basic parts and then two distinct paths, two unique ways to get those three basic parts. So when you are initially enrolling in Medicare, you will stand at a fork in the road. Okay, now, regardless of the path you choose, the three parts. Part A is hospital insurance. So this is the part of Medicare that you work and pay taxes for 10 years for, or you have a spouse who's worked and paid taxes for 10 years. Either way, this is the premium free part of Medicare that kicks in to help pay the bills when you are admitted into a hospital. It is also the part of Medicare that kicks in to pay for skilled nursing facility visits and skilled home health care. Notice that I emphasize the word skilled. Medicare does not cover long term care. Zip zilch, zero, nothing, all right? It is also the part of Medicare that helps to pay for hospice services. All right, so that's part A. Part B is the medical insurance side of Medicare. This is the part that you pay a monthly premium for. In 2021, that amount is 148.50 each month, and that is per individual. So if both spouses are on Medicare, each person pays their own Part B premium. This is the part of Medicare that you use to see doctors, to see specialists, to have labs done, diagnostics, outpatient surgeries. It also covers preventative services. It's considered optional coverage, but the point of it is if you don't get it when you're supposed to, late enrollment penalties. So be careful with the optional part. All right, then part D. D is easy, D for drugs. This is prescription drug coverage of Medicare. Now. You will never get a Part D prescription drug plan provided by the federal government. No. The federal government standardizes how drug coverage works in Medicare, but it does not provide the plans. All the plans are provided by private insurance companies, and they help to cover the cost of your prescription medications. Rarely, if ever, do they cover all of your costs. So expect to have co-pays, co-insurances, and deductibles. Again, it's considered optional coverage, but only if you're following the rules. Okay, so those are A, B, and D. Now, 
there are two distinct paths to choose from in order to get the three basic parts. So which way will you go? And please remember, some clients will have additional paths, retiree coverage options, federal employee health benefits, military benefits. So you can have more than two paths, but everybody has two, so that's what we teach. All right, so first we'll talk about original Medicare. This is the part of Medicare where we put the capital building in the background, okay? So on this path, the US government is in charge. They are administering the program. When you head down this path, you can see any provider who accepts Medicare, regardless of where you live and where the provider may be in the continent, in the United States and its territories. Contrary to popular belief, 99% of physicians accept Medicare. So when you hear that, you know, you can't find somebody that takes Medicare, no, I don't know what they're talking about because studies show 99% of physicians do accept Medicare. All right, then when you visit a doctor, a Medicare card is a typical piece of identification. So you will often have to carry that. All right, this path, you get started by enrolling in Part A and Part B, all right? about 10% of Medicare beneficiaries stop right here. They say, I'm done, I'm enrolled in Medicare, yay! No, boo, that's bad. Because A and B by themselves can be very expensive. Part A has a $1,500 hospitalization deductible. Part B, 20% of every doctor bill, specialist bill, lab, outpatient procedure comes out of your pocket. And A and B by themselves have no spending limit. Ooh, ouch, okay? So for comprehensive coverage on this path, you also add a Medigap policy and a Part D prescription drug plan. Once you put those two pieces into place, both provided by private insurance companies, the out-of-pocket costs that you might have faced if you had just A and B by itself, those costs can just go poof, gone, okay? So a Let's talk a little bit more about what a Medigap policy is. So a Medigap policy, Medicare supplement, Medigap, Medigap, Medicare supplement. They are the same thing used interchangeably. I know that's confusing. There you go. Welcome to Medicare again. All right. So a Medigap policy provides coverage of the payment gaps in Medicare Part A and Part B. So again, you just saw Medicare Part A and Part B don't cover certain things. The supplement steps in to cover those gaps. You pay a monthly premium and then have few, if any, out-of-pocket costs for healthcare services. Of course, the federal government has standardized these into different flavors of plans known by letters because it's not confusing at all to have part A, part B, part D, and a plan A. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so the, the federal government standardized these into flavors. Now, if you live in Massachusetts, Minnesota, or my state, Wisconsin, um, we have unique standardizations. Our government took our state governments took steps to standardize Medigap policies before the federal government did our standardizations were grandfathered now da -da -da -da, this is super important okay a guaranteed issue right ensures that you can get a Medigap policy Let's talk about what a guaranteed issue right is because this is going to play into a lot of conversations that we have in the remainder of this presentation. A guaranteed issue right is a period of time in which you can get a Medigap policy and the insurance companies cannot ask you about your health. They can't look at your health history. They can't ask you, you know, how you're currently feeling. They can't charge you more in premiums or deny you coverage based upon your health. But guess what? You only have a guaranteed issue right for the first one, two, three, four, five, six months that you are enrolled in Part B. Six months. It's not a very long time at all. After that six month period, if you live in 46 states in the country, not New York, Connecticut, Massachusetts, or Maine, those are different, but any other state in the nation, you may not be able to get a Medigap policy again in your life, depending on your health. The insurance companies will ask you about your health, and if they find anything they don't like, they can charge you more or say, no, thank you, we don't want you. All right, that's, that's a big deal. 
It's a guaranteed issue, right? G-I-R. It's a very big deal. We'll talk about it more. It will come up again. All right. So on this path, original Medicare, essentially when it's fully built out, you pay a monthly premium for a Medigap policy drug plan and Part B, and then have few, if any, out-of-pocket costs for healthcare services, not drugs, but healthcare services. It is a very budgeted approach to Medicare. All right, so that's original Medicare. Now, uh, these will give you kind of a, just a peek at the costs. You'll notice I have a very solid $381 per month. It's definitive. Boom. That's the thing about original Medicare. It's a very budgeted approach. I can put that number in my plan. All right. That's very different than what we're about to experience. All right. So Medicare Advantage. Now, this is the path of Medicare that is pretty much in all those commercials. Thank you, Joe Namath. <laughs> Zero dollars in monthly premiums, free dental coverage, get all the benefits coming to you right? Okay. So that's Medicare Advantage. We don't put the capital building in the background. We put a corporate building because the insurance companies are in charge on this path. They get to make the rules. You're, you're identified by an insurance card, not your Medicare card on this path. All right. So Medicare Advantage policies have to provide Part A and Part B services, but they change the rules that you have to follow in order to get those services. So we'll talk about the rules just a little bit more in a bit. All right. The plans that you get through Medicare Advantage usually roll in drug coverage, so you don't have to get a separate Part D prescription drug plan. Often it's included. All right. Now the exciting parts. You know, those zero dollars in monthly premiums. Yes, many, many Medicare Advantage plans have no monthly premiums, but that does not mean they are free. Believe me, if the insurance companies could say free Medicare Advantage plans, they would. They can't because they are not free. They have zero dollars in monthly premiums. All right, then they have extra benefits. Free vision, free hearing, dental coverage, gym membership. These are things that people get pretty excited about. Um, in fact, if you were to look at the landscape of Medicare Advantage plans, there are a lot of free benefits out there. 80% of plans now include some sort of vision coverage, like glasses or contacts. 75% of plans include dental benefits or fitness benefits. Now. What we're gonna talk about is the free glasses, free dental, because I'm pretty much guarantee you that your definition of free is not the same definition as the insurance company's version of free. So I'll, I'll show you what I mean. So let's look at the dental benefit real quick. So free dental coverage. I'm going to show you a slide pulled from medicare.gov. Don't worry if you can't read it, I'm going to explain what it says. So in the upper left corner, it says extractions, right? So this is a typical plan that I see. There are a variety of different plans, but this is not uncommon to see this. So extractions are in the upper left. If you need an extraction service, the middle column says what your responsibility is for the bill. If you go in network, 20 to 50% of the bill is coming out of your pocket, boom out of network 50 to 70 percent of that total bill is coming out of your pocket right there that's not my definition of free but let's keep going the right column shows you the hoops that you have to jump through in order to get extraction services or the limits that you will face so the first thing it says is advanced plan approval required what this means is before you can get extraction services, you have to get permission from the insurance company. If the insurance company does not give their permission and you go ahead with the extraction service anyway, 100% is coming out of your pocket. Also, there are plan limits. That's what that says that I highlighted in yellow. Plan limits limit the total amount that the insurance company will pay towards that service in any given year. For this plan in particular, the plan limit is $300 for dental benefits in any given year. Is that free? Free dental, $300? <laughs> No, free eyeglasses, if you notice the bottom, 
plan pays $100 per year for frames, lenses, and contacts. Thank you very much. I won't even get a stem of my eyeglass for that, but you know, $100 is $100. But um, according to the Kaiser Family Foundation, they did an analysis of all the Medicare Advantage plans in the United States. 59% of Medicare Advantage plans have a dental plan limit below $1,000. So are you gonna get completely free dental coverage? Probably not. Vision plan. The average plan in the United States gives you $160 reimbursement for glasses. I'm not getting my glasses for free. So anyways, um, now if you're looking at meals, transportation, bathroom safety, in-home support, get all the benefits coming to you. Well, chances are pretty good that you're not going to find a plan that covers all those things. If you do manage to find a plan that covers all of them, guess what? All the benefits coming to you very commonly is one. Choose one of the supplemental benefits below. Only one can be selected. And of course, all of the transportation, meals, home health aids, bathroom safety, whatever you choose has its own restrictions and limitations, prior authorizations, etc. So be sure to look at the details. The details are super crucial. Okay. Finally, just to tell you, what you're looking at right now is a chart of profits. The green bar shows you how much an insurance company makes per plan member per year providing an Obamacare plan. The yellow bar is providing an employer group health plan. The blue bar is a Medicare Advantage plan member. That blue bar shows you that Medicare Advantage companies make more than twice as much as they do providing an Obamacare plan per member per year. They don't make these kind of profits by providing free plans and free benefits. So just be aware and there's a lot of money exchanging hands. All right, so all of that said, what winds up happening is they put all those things together into a package of coverage that you get on this path known as an MAPD plan. It's that package that Medicare refers to as Part C. It's not a basic part. It is a way to get the basic part. So Plan C, pff, go on, just forget about it. All right, so let's talk about the rules. When you head down this path, there are very specific rules that you have to follow. You have to see providers in a network. If you go outside of the network, you may not have coverage. So when you travel, this is super important to know if you have out of network coverage or not. Also, please know that legally networks can change at any time. So if you schedule a surgery for two months, like in December, you may get a notice a week before saying the surgeon's no longer in network. Okay, they can do that. You are subject to prior authorization rules on this path. So what this means is before you get certain services, healthcare services, you will have to get the permission of the insurance company, you or your provider, okay? Pr prior authorization is everywhere in Medicare Advantage now. Essentially, a good rule of thumb is if you want to do anything other than seeing your primary care physician, expect prior authorization. It's everywhere. In fact, let me show you a chart. 99% of Medicare Advantage plans include prior authorization, and this is across the board. Part D, prescription drugs, hospital stays, ambulance services, skilled nursing facilities stays, on and on and on. So expect prior authorization. Then lastly, you are going to pay deductibles, co-pays, and co-insurances whenever you use healthcare services up to that plan's out-of-pocket spending limit. So when you break this all down, Medicare Advantage at its heart is the mere opposite of how original Medicare works. Original Medicare, you pay monthly premiums and then have no out-of-pocket costs for healthcare services. Medicare Advantage is you pay no monthly premiums, but you pay every time you use healthcare services. And by the way, if you don't follow the rules of the insurance company, you can be responsible for the full cost of 
any healthcare service regardless of out-of-pocket spending limit because the spending limit only applies when you follow the rules of the insurance company. All right, so very, very different choices. So this is the, a snapshot very quickly of the costs under Medicare Advantage. And you will notice on original Medicare, I put a number, like one number. On Medicare Advantage here, I have a range and I know what your lowest amount might be, but honestly, I have no idea what your highest amount might be. I don't know. I just don't know. My crystal ball is broken. So, um, so it's a definitely a different way to approach Medicare. Now, here's why the decision that you make when you enroll in Medicare is so important. You can become stuck. So imagine you just chose your path and you head in, in that direction. Now you have to imagine an earthquake happens behind you. Ah, okay. Now, if you want to change the type of coverage that you have, you have to wait for a bridge. Bridges are only open certain times in the year, and in order to cross, a, to cross that bridge, you have to follow the bridge's rules. It is actually pretty dang simple to switch from the path of original Medicare with a Medigap policy to a Medicare Advantage. As long as you're doing it at the right time of year, right now, go ahead. Insurance companies can't ask you about your health. In fact, they really, really want you. Here's the problem. People think, I'm going to enroll in Advantage. I'm really healthy. And you know, later on when something happens, I'll switch then. Yeah, that's not how this works. Remember, guaranteed issue right. You only have a guaranteed issue right to get a Medigap policy for the first one, two, three, four, five, six months that you are enrolled in Part B. After that, the insurance companies, if you decide you wanna switch, can ask you about your health. If they find anything they don't like, they can say, nah, we don't want you. You can still switch to original and get A and B. But remember, A and B have all those out-of-pocket costs with no spending limit. The reason people typically want out of Medicare Advantage is something has changed. And now they need to see a provider out of network. They're getting all sorts of bills. They're coming up against prior authorization restrictions. They want what original Medicare with a Medigap is, but that's gone. So be aware that is what can happen. Okay. All right. So knowing all of that, I'm going to skip ahead now to um, the sixth step, which is review your coverage annually. We are currently in the initial enrollment or the initial. We are currently in Medicare's open enrollment period. It is also called the uh, annual, oh goodness gracious, AEP, <laughs> annual election period. There it is. I got it. Annual election period. Um, the new plans, so during this time you review your Part D drug coverage or Medicare Advantage coverage and the new plan will take effect January 1st. All right. The reason you want to review your drug coverage or your Medicare Advantage coverage is quite frankly that everything about the plan can change. Premiums, deductibles, out-of-pocket costs, co-pays, spending limits, pharmacy networks, provider networks, the restrictions, prior authorization, step therapy, etc. All of these things can change within a plan, all while keeping the exact same plan name. So it can be entirely different coverage with the same name. So what winds up happening, oh, well, first I need to just give you a caveat real quick. Please know open enrollment is not about Medigap policies. Open enrollment is for changing Medicare Advantage plans and Part D prescription drug plans, not Medigap policies because of the guaranteed issue right. You can technically switch Medigap policies any time of the year. It's, it's all about guaranteed issue right. Will you be able to get it? And the other thing to know too, is in order to switch Medigap policies in many, many states, you will have to go through underwriting to switch Medigap policies. So it's not an open enrollment thing. It's, it's, it's not something you do during open enrollment. It's technically you can review your Medigap policy any time of the year. It's just, will you be able to get it? Will you be able to go through underwriting and be approved? So, 
when we work with people to initially choose their coverage, we approach choosing Medigap policies very carefully because you may be picking a plan for the next 10, 20, 30 years. So it's a policy. It's best to think of it as a policy for life. All right. We hear this all the time. I'm happy with my coverage. My coverage works really well. Why do I need to review it? And this is what winds up happening. Pretty much on right on cue, come February, March, or April, we'll start seeing news stories. Those evil drug companies, they always gouge seniors. I used to pay $50 for my medication. Now I pay $500. Those evil companies. Yeah, it's probably much more likely that she didn't review her drug coverage during open enrollment and it changed dramatically, not in her favor. That's really what winds up happening. So the reason that you review plans is because the plan that you have this year, again, could be an entirely different plan with the same name next year. Here's the other thing. Only 13% of Medicare beneficiaries actually review their coverage during open enrollment. Guess what? Insurance companies know that. They know that they're free to make changes that are in their benefit, but not in yours. Right? The, uh, according to a study done, if you are reviewing your drug coverage, you are potentially saving yourself an average of $368 per year. The counter is also true. So if you haven't reviewed your drug coverage in the last five years, take 368, multiply it by five, and potentially that's how much you're overpaying typically for the drug coverage that you have. And then last but not least, please know that reviewing your coverage really can save you lots of money. In fact, our company um, does annual reviews, and, and this is not a plug for that, but Typically, we save clients on average about $2,100 um, during our after our analysis of what happened during open enrollment. And this is the biggest reason why you want to do it. We, our current company's record is a woman, I kid you not, saved $235,000 by changing drug plans for one calendar year. If you take any prescription brand name prescription medications, it's critical that you review your drug coverage each and every year. Even if you take just one brand name medication and that's the only medication you take, review your drug coverage. Okay. All right. Now, with all that, anything else to know? Yes, there are two myths I want to tell you about. Num myth number one, everyone pays the same for Medicare. Mm -mm, no, sorry. Some people pay more for Medicare. It's called Irma. Irma's not a nice lady. She's the income-related monthly adjustment amount. Oh, I missed the M. So it's the income-related monthly adjustment amount. I'm so sorry I missed the monthly. All right. If your income it is more, here, let me, let me bring up the chart. It depends on how you file your taxes. If you're a single filer, you take the adjusted gross income line and add it to the tax exempt interest line. If those two amounts added up are more than $88,000, you're gonna be subject to higher Medicare premiums. And the amount varies depending on which tier you wind up in. The IRMA amounts listed in the right columns are for Part B and Part D. So if you're, uh, you're subject to IRMA and you have a Part D drug plan and enrolled in Part B, guess what? You pay one of each. And these amounts get added to your existing Part B premium. So it's not, it's added in addition to the one for $148.50. The $12.30 for that that IRMA tier, that gets added to your standard part, whatever your Part D prescription drug plan is. And this is per month, per individual. So if both spouses are on Medicare, go ahead and double that. So, and again, it depends on whether you're filing singly, individuals filing jointly, or married filing separately. Um, if you're married filing separately, ooh, they hit you pretty hard. So, all right, with that, I'm going to tell you about Patricia and Mark. Okay, so Patricia and Mark, they're, 
their adjusted gross income and tax exempt interest added together from 2020 was about 314,000. Both spouses are retiring December of 2021. They expect that their income will drop in 2022 overall to about $150,000. But Social Security uses tax returns from two years ago to determine the current year's IRMA premium. So according to this, this couple is going to be subject to higher Medicare premiums to the tune of about $577 a month added. But they're not going to make that kind of money anymore. That's not fair. What do they do? Well, in this particular instance, they file a life-changing event notice. Let me show you a preview of what that sort of looks like. So it's a form, it's a Social Security Administration form that's about six pages in length. It's called the SSA 44 form, four, four, <laughs> two and two, four, four. So, um, oops, I went back too far, sorry. One more time. So they file a life-changing event notice. This Social Security form, SSA 44 form, tells Social Security that the client had a life-changing event. Life-changing events, work stoppage, retirement, work reduction, I went part-time, death of a spouse, divorce, marriage, why marriage would reduce your income, I don't know, but there you go loss of income producing property. Now this is not a sale. This is my income producing property burned down, you know, had a mudslide, whatever. So it's not a sale. If any of these life changing events have happened to you and as a result, your income for the current year is projected to be less than the two year look back that social security is using, file that form and immediately get these premiums reduced or eliminated. Do not wait for your next tax returns. If you wait for the next tax returns, that's it, it's too late. You've already paid a whole bunch of IRMA premiums. The government doesn't send you a refund check. If anything, they send you a thank you letter. Thank you for overpaying, we appreciate it. So um, you may have to file the life-changing event notice for multiple years until what is current with your income is the same as the two-year look back that Social Security is using with your tax returns. So, so until those two are the same, continue to file a life-changing event notice each year, okay? All right, so again, that's the form, SSA 44. It's very critical. Please know, one-time transactions can trigger IRMA. So lottery and casino winnings, sale of a property, capital gains, IRA withdrawals, Roth conversions, required minimum distributions, all of these things can trigger IRMA adjustments. So the good news is if you have a sale of property, the IRMA amounts are only going to last one year. You can't file life-changing event notice for capital gains, IRA withdrawals, Roth conversions, RMDs. That's not considered a life-changing event. So you pay them for a year and then say farewell, get out of here, goodbye. <laughs> All right. Then Medic uh, Medicare myth number two, Medicare covers long-term care. I said this before, but it's worth saying again, no, Medicare does not cover long-term care. 56% of baby boomers believe that Medicare will cover long-term care and just 45% of boomers believe they will ever need long-term care. That's, that's not good. These are not good myths because Medicare pays for nothing and more than 70% of people turning 65 today will need long-term care at some point and it isn't cheap. So annual costs, nursing home, $82,000, assisted living facility, $43,000, home health care, $22,000 annually. If your retirement plan does not have this built into it, please take steps now to talk to Evans May and get, and get a plan for this. And a plan doesn't necessarily have to mean long-term care insurance. There's a lot of other ways to solve this than simply long-term care insurance. All right, so final tips. Pay attention to Medicare and open enrollment, please. Don't make assumptions. Don't 
you know, everybody's different. Everybody has different circumstances. So if your friend was still working and it was fine that they didn't enroll in Medicare, don't necessarily assume that that applies to you. Take the time to actually look at your situation and determine what is best for you. Go beyond agents and friends when making your decisions, please. Agents, are, um, agents' job are to sell what's in their sales portfolio that may or may not be in your best interest. Whenever you talk to Social Security or Medicare about anything, please document the date, the time, the individual you spoke to, and whatever was said. It is possible to get wrong, bad advice from Medicare or Social Security. If they give you bad advice and you haven't documented what was said in the date and time, you have absolutely no recourse. It's going to be hard enough with the documentation. So consider the impacts of IRMA. So plan for IRMA if it's going to be applicable to you. Address long-term care needs. It's serious. Medicare doesn't cover it. And establish a budget for Medicare, Medicare healthcare long-term care costs. Evans May can help you do that and do it really well. So please, just you know them, reach out to them and, and get a plan in place to make sure that, you know, your healthcare costs are good in the future and they won't exceed your budget and your, your needs, so your, your financial plan. All right, where to get help? Okay, so when it comes to Medicare, you can head to the Medicare.gov plan finder tool. Remember, if you're using the plan finder tool, look at total costs, not just premiums. Premiums are not how much you will pay in total. It's just the premium amount. So be sure to look at what you would spend any money on. And some insurance agents will help you review coverage at no charge. Just remember, insurance agents are paid to sell specific plans. If what happens to be best for you is outside of their portfolio, they might tell you there's some insurance agents out there that I've had the pleasure of meeting who will tell you, you know, I can't sell you what's best for you. But that's the exception, not the rule. Um, some pharmacies will review drug plans and Medicare Advantage plans at no charge. They will tell you which plans are would give you the lowest cost at their pharmacy. There are, can be differences of hundreds, if not thousands of dollars by choosing different pharmacies. If you have Walgreens review your drug coverage, they're only going to tell you what is best using the Walgreens pharmacy, obviously. So if your lowest, if your best plan option happened to be the combination of your medications, um, a specific drug plan and the CVS pharmacy, you won't know that heading to a Walgreens, but that's okay. You know, maybe that's okay. Um, there's also something called SHIPS, the state health insurance programs. These are government funded programs provided through local governments, state and local governments. They often offer um, plan review services on a volunteer basis. So volunteers get trained to help you review drug coverage. But it, please know, again, they're volunteers. They've been trained for a couple weeks, a month. Some are really, really great. Some are brand new. You get what you get. They're volunteers. So, and the skills and services offered by ships vary greatly by location. So check out what's going on at your local ship and see. Maybe it's a good place to start. Also, there are fee-for-service professionals like us, but obviously we don't sell anything, so we have to charge a fee. So that is definitely a downside for us. But if that's okay with you, hey, we're available. You don't have to use us. So all right, so with that, I'm open to questions, and I think, is Emily popping back on? Let's see. Let's see. Ah. We're back. Thank okay. you, Linda. wonderful. We appreciate all your information. Um, the, um, the first question we have, um, wanted to know, is there, what Medigap policy or Medicare supplement would be the most comprehensive? Is there okay. one that has the, the 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 most vast coverage? So if you're looking for if you're looking for soup to nuts, Plan G is good. Plan G, Plan G is good. That's my cheat sheet for that. Plan G offers you the most comprehensive coverage that you can get, um, and usually it's not as expensive as you might think it might be. Okay, great, thank you. 
Mm -hmm. um, just a note for um, the attendees, the Q&A feature at the bottom can be used to submit questions. Um, just a reminder of that, that's available to you. Um, that's, you'll have to type them in um, for us to get to those. Um, a question you for you. Do you have any questions? What'd you say? You two have any questions? I have a question. Um, okay. And so um, I'm wondering if you've seen any trends while you've been working with people during this open enrollment period that would be nice for folks to know about. So the trends that I've seen so far is that Medicare Advantage continues to become more and more and more popular. Um, and now it's impacting plan selection. So what I mean by that is typically in every zip code I've looked in so far, every single one, and we're talking many zip codes now, um, but there is about 33% less Part D drug plans available and about 33% more Medicare Advantage plans available in just about every zip code I've seen. So as as Medicare Advantage continues to increase, increase, the choices just keep exploding. And meanwhile, these people over here <laughs> get fewer and fewer choices. So that's what I've seen this year. That's the big takeaway. So. Got it. Another question for you, when you're comparing um, drug coverage from year to year, are you, what resources are you using to compare last year's coverage to this year's coverage? Well, this is really good news. So we use predominantly the same tool that you, everybody has access to. So the Medicare.gov plan finder tool is actually, I'm going to be honest, it, it's pretty good if you know what you're looking for. And again, the thing you want to look for is cost, quality, and coverage. Okay, so cost, total cost not just monthly premium. Please don't pick a drug plan by its monthly premium because your drug coverage is all about getting your prescription medication refills at the most cost-effective price you can get. Believe it or not, I've seen time and time again that people with brand name medications or a lot of medications wind up doing thousands of dollars better in the course of a year with a $120 per month drug plan premium than they would in a $10 per month drug plan premium. But that's not always true because I can also find people who have 10 medications that are better in the $10 plan than in the $113 plan. So it really, it really comes down to your specific prescription medications and the pharmacy and the drug plan that together give you the best total out of pocket cost. So you wanna look at pharmacy options. I don't care if you don't go to Walmart, you've never gone to Walmart, you've never gone to Publix, you've never gone to CVS. Put them, the drug, the Medicare.gov plan finder lets you pick up to four pharmacies. Fill it up. See, play with it because you may find that you can potentially save hundreds if not thousands of dollars by simply changing pharmacies. So yeah, that's a big deal. Um, you can't review supplements and when it comes to Medicare Advantage plans, be sure to check the networks because networks are always changing. So if you're looking at Medicare Advantage plans, take the time to put your doctors in and make sure they're still in network. There you go. Excellent. Well, this has been incredibly informative, Melinda. I got one yeah. more caveat, though. Sure, if go you, for it. If you're on a Medicare Advantage plan, the Medicare.gov plan finder tool will not tell you doctors. Unfortunately, you have to go to the plan's websites specifically to check networks. Do it. Take the extra step. It's worth it. So there you go. There you go. Thank you, Melinda. Thank you so much. Really great information. Thank you. Have really uh, good for those in attendance. I know a couple people joined a few minutes after we got started. Um, we're, we've recorded this and um, we'll have it available. So reach out to us if you'd like a copy. Um, and um, in the meantime, we just want to wish everyone well this evening. And um, if you need anything, please don't hesitate to call our office. We're happy to help. Brooke, yeah. more, you're putting it on your website, right? We are. We are going to put it on a website. I think we're going to break it up into topics, um, so, segments, and add it to the website. 
anybody can share it with their friends then. So if they heard something today that they think is applicable, yeah. do that, share yeah. it. We will, yeah. we'll add to the website in about a week um, and um, we'll break it up into segments that are specific to the topics we covered. And so if there's something you wanna go back and revisit or you wanna share with a friend or family member, uh, you'll be able to do so by going to evansmay.com. Right. Emily, thank you for putting everything together. And again, reach out to us if we can do anything to help. And thank you, Melinda. Bye.